Hebrews chapter 11. If you'll open your Bible there to Hebrews chapter 11. I'm going to read a few verses of Scripture. We want to welcome you to the service this morning. Both members and visitors alike, those of you who are visiting with us, we're thankful that you've come today, and we hope that you'll feel welcome. Hebrews chapter 11. I enjoyed the good songs that the choir uh, put together. I know uh, a lot of practice went into that, and I appreciate those who put the effort into getting that ready and those who put forth the effort in coming and practicing and singing this morning. Uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with being patriotic. In fact, the Bible, I, I know you won't just find a particular verse of Scripture where the Bible says, Thou shalt be patriotic. But the Bible teaches us to, uh, you know, respect our leaders, to pray for our leaders. And uh, I believe that uh, the Lord Jesus Christ uh, was not one who was just uh, anti, uh, anti-patriotic. I don't know if that'd be even a good phrase, a good word, but uh, I know that he didn't get into the societal issues of that day. Uh, nevertheless, that uh, we need to be thankful for, for living in the country that we live in. I say that much. And uh, there's those who say they're ashamed to be called Americans. And I'll just be honest with you this morning, maybe they ought to go try somewhere else. And they might come back and say, well, I'm glad, proud to be an American. Because we are blessed, no doubt, above all people in the world. And I want to remind you of this, and I'll remind myself of this this morning. We had no choice in the matter where we grew up. We may think we did, we may act like we did, but we didn't. That it was just by the grace of God that uh, we were allowed to grow up in this great nation. And even in this part of the nation, uh, I may be just a little bit partial, but I believe the South is the best part of the, this nation. And uh, I think you probably would agree with that. If you were from another part of the nation, you might disagree, but I'm thankful for it. Hebrews chapter 11, let's read, beginning of verse 24. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect under the recompense of the reward. By faith, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. He endured as seeing him who is invisible. I'm going to come back to this passage of Scripture in, in a few minutes and uh, look at a particular thought uh, out of this passage of Scripture. But I want to deal with some things today, even concerning the day that we are commemorating and celebrating today, and uh, that is the 4th of July. Uh, we know, and, and I'm not going to, I'm going to assume that we don't know anything this morning, and I'm not insulting your intelligence in any way. Uh, many of you would probably understand this better than I do. But... The 4th of July is not just a day to eat hot dogs and hamburgers and shoot fireworks and go to the river. The 4th of July is special to us because that on July the 4th, 1776, that the Declaration of Independence was signed. And that was a formal declaration of the fact that the United States was breaking free from the British rule. And if you do the math, I had to do the math, I wasn't sure, but I added it up. And I, today, if I did the math right, today is the 245th anniversary of the uh, signing of the Declaration of Independence. And uh, several years ago, I was able to go into the, I believe it was in the National Archives, if my memory is correct. There's so many of those buildings in Washington, D.C., but I was able to go in there and, and see that original document and... Uh, I tell you what, it's something special. I mentioned about the uh, Star Spangled Banner. You need to read the words, you never read it. Go back and read the Declaration of Independence. Uh, you say, well, I don't understand a lot of, of the language that's in it. Get you a dictionary. It'll help you. Uh, Thomas Jefferson was a brilliant man. He was a brilliant, brilliant man among brilliant men. And he crafted this, he wrote this, and of course with some changes that the Continental Congress made, into its final form, uh, but uh, I, I believe you can see the hand of God even in that, and uh, in, in the words that he uh, wrote there. And this morning, I want to remind you of this, that over these 245 years, God has blessed America. You hear me? 
God has blessed this country. We sing God bless America. Uh, I think a better way would maybe America has blessed God. We need to bless God. The blessings of God flow when, when His people, uh, when a country is, is uh, close to Him and near to Him and obedient unto Him. But the question is, you know, is this, why has God blessed this country as He has? You thought about that? Why has He blessed us? Why, why has this country become the greatest nation on the face of the earth and become as strong as it has and as powerful as it has and been as successful as it has? Well, you know, preacher, that Americans that, you know, they're just hardy people that we just don't give up. There's a lot of ingenuity and there's fortitude and, and, and that's why we've become as great as we are. You better look further than the people. I tell you why, why, we've, why that America has become a great nation or, or, or has been a great nation over these past uh, almost 250 years now is a, I believe you can find the answer to that in a verse of scripture that the little ones uh, gave us a few minutes ago in the book of Psalm chapter 33 and verse 12. The scripture says, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And I believe that on the whole, that through our history, that God has been the Lord of our nation. You go back to the, the documents and the things of our founding fathers, and you find uh, many references to the scriptures, to the Word of God. The Word of God uh, has uh, been a, a centerpiece and a cornerstone of life in this country. And uh, when it ceases to be, that this nation will cease to be great. When the Word of God ceases to have the place that it needs to have in the lives of the people. And I know for many people today that it has. I hope it has not in your home. And uh, you know, when you think about a nation, a nation is not just one unit, but a nation is made up of many individual families. And so we can complain, we can, we can criticize, uh, we can talk bad about our nation, but the bottom line is this, that I can't do anything else about any other home, but I can do something about my home. And I can teach my children and my family the things of God. When you think about our country, I believe another reason the United States has been blessed by God is that the United States has sent missionaries all over the world to spread the gospel, haven't we? You think about that. That we were criticized for that. Uh, you go back to the early part of the 1900s. And there was a movement uh, among many people uh, to try to even do away with the American missionaries. Felt like that it demeaned people, but it, it didn't. But of all the countries in the world, that the United States, no doubt, has had a greater influence and impact on getting the gospel spread throughout the world. Let me give you another reason I believe that God has blessed this nation is this nation has been friendly to God's people, hasn't it? To his people of the, say, of the flesh, to the Jewish people. That many nations around the world, that uh, they have been hostile, openly hostile to the Jewish people. But this nation, as far as I know, has been a place where the Jewish people could come and they could find a haven. They could find uh, rest, they could find peace in this nation. And you wonder, well, why are there so many Jewish people in the United States? Maybe not in the rural areas. They tend to congregate in large cities. But that's because the United States has been good to those people. We've been good to the nation of Israel since the nation of Israel became a nation again following World War II. And uh, we need to continue to do that. Uh, way back yonder, God said he would bless those that, that were good to his people. He would curse those who cursed his people. And uh, I want us to remember that. But I want us to remember this as well this morning. I believe God's been good to this nation because he's a gracious and a merciful God. Above all, it's not just because of our goodness, uh, because we deserve it. We don't deserve it. Uh, but you think about even all the natural resources that God has given this nation. In the center part of our nation is the breadbasket of the world. He's allowed us to produce food. We've not gone hungry. He's given us natural resources. He's given us fossil fuels, things to, to fuel our economy and to fuel our country. He's given us beautiful scenery. And there's so many things that he has blessed us with in this country. For a few minutes this morning, I'm going to come back to my scripture. I want us to go back to the years before 1776. I don't want to just give you a history lesson this morning, 
but I want to, it's on my heart to, to go over a few things with you and then to try to take a thought uh, out of that. So we made the statement that July the 4th, 1776, that the Declaration of Independence was signed. It was a formal declaration that we were parting, parting ways, breaking ties with the empire of, of Great Britain. You young ones that are here this morning, I used to always tell my kids in, uh, when I taught school this, I said, you better be glad that we won the Revolutionary War because if we wouldn't have, we'd all be speaking English. Well, I'll let you ponder on that one for, for a minute. Glad we won the war, we'd all be speaking English. The, the 13 American colonies, that, that those 13 colonies uh, were part of a vast British empire uh, that, were, that uh, were under control of the British Parliament and the British Crown under a king and, and under uh, his control and under control of, of the uh, Parliament. Of, of England, and uh, for many, many years, I'm not going to go back and, and just go through all the steps. We know Jamestown and Williamsburg and the Pilgrims and all of those things, but uh, for many years after the colonies were set up in, in the New World, England was very lax in uh, their control of the colonies. I'm going to use a term this morning, I wrote it down so I wouldn't forget it. The, the name or the official term for that was called salutary or salutary neglect. Salutary neglect. What that meant was this. They pretty much just allowed the colonies to be independent, to do what they wanted to do, as long as the colonies would remain, um, would, would keep their allegiance to the British crown. They would remain loyal. That was the word I was looking for. As long as they would remain loyal uh, to the British crown. And uh, so the, the colonists, that they became accustomed to having a great degree of independence, a great degree of freedom. Uh, the, the taxes were very low. In fact, many of the taxes that Parliament uh, had enacted, they didn't even enforce those things in, in the New World. And uh, so that this was a place that people came and people prospered here. But beginning in the 1760s, uh, that this policy of salutary neglect began to be reversed. And uh, Parliament began to enact a series of taxes upon the colonies. Uh, you studied about those in school, like the Stamp Act and the, uh, the, the, the sugar tax, a tax on tea, tax on printed materials. A lot of different taxes that had been on the books all along, they had not been enforcing them, that they begin to try to enforce those things. Y'all know that never works, by the way. It doesn't work in raising children. It doesn't work in teaching school. You can't just be lax on a group of people for a long period of time and then say, I'm going to crack down. What are you going to have? You're going to have pushback, aren't you? That you're going to have a rebellion. And uh, that's why that it's important that as parents, we be consistent in the discipline of our children. Even in things that we do, you know, I think about this as a pastor. Brother Matt mentioned some things this morning, and let me chase a rabbit for just a minute. I try not to chase rabbits. But Brother Matt mentioned some things in his Sunday school devotion uh, concerning uh, different ways that people try to worship, different gospels that uh, churches have put in place today. And, uh, you know, those things didn't start there, did they? But Matt, that, that moving away from the true gospel didn't start with a month of movies, did it? It started very slowly, didn't it? One step at a time. Becoming lax in this, becoming lax in that, becoming lax in the other. And before they knew it, that all those little steps had turned in to uh, a situation where they were far away from where they once were. And there's no going back. There, there, there's no saying that we're, we're just going to reverse all that and go back to the truth. Uh, you, you can do it. And you'll lose your people. You'll lose your congregation. And probably the, the church will close its doors. So I, ha I have people ask me, well, preacher, you know, what, what's the big deal? What will it hurt doing this? What will it hurt doing that? What will it hurt doing the other? Well, it may not hurt anything in the short term. But th let's think about things from a long-term standpoint. Just one step at a time. 
one step away from the truth over time that you have a situation where you're far away from where you ever began, where you wanted to be. And so we need to be careful. Even the things that we allow ourselves to compromise in areas of our life, even in the church, things that, ways that we allow compromise uh, in the world to come into the church, because if you're not careful, before long you're way away from where you intended to be. And so that Britain said we're going to crack down. We're going to begin enforcing these things again. And the colonists said, no, you're not. Among other things, they told them that, uh, that uh, you must keep troops in your homes. How would you like that? Get a knock on your door. This British soldier standing there in his red coat, and he's going to spend the night with you tonight. I want tomato gravy, tomato gravy and rice and biscuits, you know. Get, up, get after it. I'm staying with you tonight. They required people to quarter troops. They, they told people who moved out in the frontier that, you know, past a certain line that you, you, you're not allowed to be out there. And they would go and they would evict them from their homes. A lot of things that they began to do that caused resentment among the colonists. And over time that this resistance grew more and more intense. And then in 1774, I know I'm giving you a history lesson. In 1774, colonists... Uh, Delegates from each of the colonies met in Philadelphia at the First Continental Congress, and they discussed, what are we going to do about this? There's, there, were, there were a lot of events that had taken place. The Boston Tea Party uh, had, had taken place, and, and there had been skirmishes that had, that had taken place. And uh, the, the First Continental Congress in 1774, that their decision was, we're going to try to make peace with the king. We're going to try to get the, these, these wrongs righted. And uh, let's, try to, let, let's try to work together with, uh, with, with Great Britain. But then the next year, in April of 1775, a British regiment marched from Boston to Concord, Massachusetts. And they were going there to seize weapons that a, that a Massachusetts militia had there that the, that the British troops had found out about it. And they were going there to seize those things. And that's when you read about Paul Revere and how that he would ride ahead of them. That you know, the red coats are they say this. We always heard the British are coming, but I think officially the red coats are coming. That he would he would ride and he would tell them that the, the red coats are coming and, and the militiamen and the minutemen would get, would get their weapons and they would we, would come together. And uh, we know that uh, that there uh, along that route that a skirmish took place and a shot was fired. And what did they call that shot? The shot heard round the world, didn't it? The shot heard round the world. And that, that those British troops, that they would go on to Concord and they would find that the, that the uh, arsenal had been emptied and they would try to work their way back to Boston and they'd be fired upon all the way back to Boston. And uh, you, you think about how that intensified the things that were going on there. And then the next year, I'm sorry, in, in May of 1775, the next month, the Second Continental Congress met, and again with delegates from the colonies, and they would send King George something called the Olive Branch Petition. And it was basically a, uh, a, a final effort by the colonists to try to make peace with, uh, with Great Britain. They promised they would be allegiant, uh, they would, they would uh, be loyal to him if he would just back off some of those things that they were doing, and he rejected it. And so at that point, that one by one, the colonial governments begin to support full independence. And that's when that the Second Continental Congress would appoint a committee of five, if my memory serves me correctly, but among those would be Thomas Jefferson. And he would pen that document known as the Declaration of Independence. And on July the 4th, 1776, that, that would be signed by 56 men those 56 men were from the 13 colonies, and uh, John Hancock was the president of the Second Continental Congress. He would write his name real big, wouldn't he? On top of that thing. And there's a quote that came out of that. I know it's, depending on what source you look at, you may find it written just a little bit different. But it said that John Hancock made the statement after they had signed this document. He said, we must all hang together. In other words, those men that had signed that, we, we've got to be united. We've got we've to hang together. 
And it said that Benjamin Franklin spoke up, and he said, yes, he said, we must all hang together, or assuredly, we shall all hang separately. That if we don't hang together, that, that we're, going to, we're going to hang, that we're going to lose. And uh, I want to kind of just take that for just a minute and, and take a thought out of that this morning. You think about those men that signed that document, 56 men. Undoubtedly, that was one of the most consequential actions of their life, wasn't it? What's the big deal signing your name on a document? Because when they signed their name on that document, they were traitors guilty of treason, weren't they? Punishable by death. And they knew that. They knew that the moment they signed that document, that there was a target on their back. They knew that if they were taken in battle, uh, that they could be tried and they were going to be convicted. It, it wasn't a matter whether they were innocent or they were guilty, but they would be put to death. And I don't believe they did this suddenly. I don't believe they did this lightly. I don't believe that, that you know, any of them just walked in and somebody said, hey, sign this, and they just, like we do sometimes, just signed it. No doubt they read it, they pondered on it, they thought about the ramifications of it, the consequences of it upon them, upon their families, upon their businesses, upon every part of their lives. And they made this statement, one of the last statements in the Declaration of Independence, they said that we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. We're ple you know, look, our lives are on the line, our fortunes on the line, our honor's on the line. We understand the seriousness of this, and we're signing this thing. And when you go and you read about those men, many of these men suffered greatly because that they signed the Declaration of Independence. Uh, Several of them were taken in battle, and uh, they were tortured by the British. Many of them lost family members in the war. Many of them lost their homes. Many of them lost their fortunes, their businesses. It said just about every one of them was worse off when the war was over than they were when it began. Because of their commitment and, and their resolve and their decision, to sign this document, this Declaration of Independence. And yet, that even though they suffered because of their actions, yet they thought that it was a worthy cause. And uh, I believe that when it was over, that they could, would have said that it was worth it, that we were willing to, to do this. Let's go back to Moses in Hebrews chapter 11. In some ways, Moses faced a similar situation in his life. He said that he came to a point in his life that he had to make a decision. And we know that decision. He was raised up in the palace of Pharaoh. and He had everything. And yet he knew that I'm not one of these folk. I'm a Hebrew. And that choosing rather to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, that he chose to suffer affliction with the people of God. And we read that, verse 25, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Let me ask you a question this morning. Did Moses understand the ramifications of his actions? Those 56 men that put their names on that document, did they understand what they were signing? Did they understand the choice that they were making? Did they understand the, the, the consequences of this? Sure they did. And yet they felt that it worthy, a, a worthy enough cause to do it, and we'll live with the consequences. Moses did the same thing. He came to that point in his life, I've either got to be an Egyptian or I've got to be a, an Israelite. I've got to be a, a Hebrew. And so that he said, I'm going to choose to be a Hebrew. And he said, I know, I know the ramifications of this. I know the consequences of this. I know it's going to impact my life. Things are going to be different, but I'm willing to do it. And things were different for Moses. In fact, the Bible says, uh, Brother Kyle, that Pharaoh desired to slay him, didn't he? He desired to slay him. And, and, and I know that Moses had killed a man and, 
And you, you can read about that. And, uh, an Egyptian that was smiting a Hebrew. And, and yet, I don't believe that's the only reason Pharaoh desired to kill him or to slay him. I believe that he desired to slay him because he left. He was a traitor. He left the palace to be with his people. You know, Moses could have made the decision, well, I'm, I'm going to be a Hebrew in spirit, and I'll be an Egyptian in the flesh, you know. I'll just use that excuse. You know, my heart will be with them, but I'm going to just continue to enjoy the things that I'm enjoying now. Go back to the book of John, chapter 19, if you would. John, chapter 19. I want to read about another man. And I'm going to try to tie all this together. John chapter 19. You think about those 56 men that signed that document. They said, we're going to throw our lot with the colonists. Everything that we have, we're going to throw it with these people. Let come what may, whatever happens, that we're, we're, we're 100%, we're in, and we're declaring to the world that we have broken away from Great Britain. We're no longer British, but we're Americans. You think about what Moses did. He said, I'm going to throw my lot with God's people. He said, I'm no longer an Egyptian, but I'm a Hebrew. Let come what may, I'm, I'm, I'm going to declare to the world that I'm a Hebrew. John chapter 19, we read about a man here, verse 38. It said, and after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews. Let's talk about this man for a minute. Joseph of Arimathea, he was a great man. He was a wealthy man. In fact, that it was prophesied in the 53rd chapter of Isaiah that, that Jesus would make his grave with the rich, and that's what this is talking about. But Joseph of Arimathea was a powerful man. He was an educated man. He sat on the Sanhedrin council. Uh, he was in a place of, of prominence, a place of power. Uh, in, the, in the nation of Israel during the time of the Lord Jesus. But somewhere along the way that the Lord got a hold of him. And, and no, he, he, along with everybody else in that area, they couldn't, there was no way that you could avoid hearing about Jesus, seeing the things that he did. And no doubt Joseph of Arimathea saw those things. The Bible says he was an honorable counselor. And it says here in verse 38, what we just read, he was a disciple of Jesus. He was a disciple of Jesus. He was a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. But how did he do it? He did it secretly, didn't he? He didn't do it out in public. He followed the Lord Jesus Christ secretly. It tells us why fear of the Jews. I don't know how long that he had been a believer. I know this. When it came time for the Sanhedrin to vote on whether or not to convict Jesus, he didn't vote to convict. He consented not unto his death, the Bible says. So he was a disciple, but he was a secret He was like Moses before Moses chose to, to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. No doubt there was a time when Moses said, I'm not an Egyptian, I don't know what I'm doing here. I don't know how long a time that was. Moses didn't just get up one day and said, you know, I'm leaving this place. Before a time, his heart wasn't with Pharaoh's people. His heart was with his people. For a time, Joseph of Arimathea's heart had been with Christ, had been with his people. But as we come here, the middle part of verse 38, it said that he besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him leave or gave him permission. He came, therefore, and took the body of Jesus. There came also Nicodemus, which at first came to Jesus by night, and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight, then took they the body of Jesus and wound it in linen clothes with the spices as the manner of the Jews is to bury. What did Joseph of Arimathea do? He went to Pilate and he begged the body of Jesus. 
Well, that doesn't mean that he, you know, publicly announced that he was a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, yes, it does. In those days, only friends of a convicted or an accused criminal who had been put to death would go and take the body because all the, the, all the Roman soldiers would have done was just thrown it in a, a burn pile somewhere. He went and he begged the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Brother Rodney, he wasn't alone. There was another man, a man we read about in the third chapter of the book of John named Nicodemus, who had come to Jesus by night. And Jesus told him that he must be born again. And he, he told him about the new birth and how that he could be born again. And told him, and, and told him about the brazen serpent that was put on the pole in the Old Testament and how Jesus would be raised up above the earth in the same way. And that through believing in him that he could be saved. And so those two men that night, they took the body of Jesus. They took it. They anointed the body of Jesus. They wrapped it in linen clothes, and they placed it in a new tomb. They placed it in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. What did those two men do that night? They threw their lot with Jesus, didn't they? For some reason... For some reason, I don't know why it was this time, but for whatever reason, those who had been secret disciples of Jesus, they said, we're no longer going to be secret disciples of Jesus. We're going to sign the declaration. We're going to profess to the world that we're his followers. No matter what it cost us, no matter the consequences, we're tired of being secret followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And tonight, we're going to declare to the world that we're believers and that we trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. You reckon that encouraged other people to see those two men take that step of faith? There's no doubt that it encouraged a lot of people. You can go over and read in the book of Acts, you see a company of priests, a great company of priests that were obedient to the faith. You see those in, in Caesar's household after Paul went there and he preached unto them. You see many influential people that trusted the Lord Jesus Christ. And I, I'm not saying all of those are because of Nicodemus or because, or because of Joseph of Arimathea. But I'm thankful that they were willing to cast their lot with the people of God. And listen to me this morning. Those 56 men that signed the Declaration of Independence, were they sure of the outcome of that war? They were not. I mean, we know the end of it. But going into that thing, there wasn't much hope. A few little old farmers were going to defeat the greatest army in the world. You see, they signed that Declaration of Independence unsure of the outcome. But I tell you what they were sure of. They were sure of the cause. And they said, we're willing, no matter what it costs us, to profess that we believe in this new country. We believe in independence. And whatever it costs us, we're willing to take it. And we're, we're willing to be numbered with the patriots. We're willing to be numbered as being Americans. I want to ask you something this morning as we come to a close. Are you willing to be numbered with the people of God? Are you willing to be known as a Christian? Are you willing to be known as a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ? The preacher, I don't know. I'm just going to follow him afar off. I'm just going to do like Joseph of Arimathea. I'll be a secret disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. I can still go to heaven even as a secret disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ because what matters is that you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ with all your heart. Well, I believe that once a person trusts in the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, I believe that their soul is saved for eternity. I believe that. But the Bible teaches that we're to confess him before men. We're not to be ashamed of him. This morning, I wonder if there'd be anybody here that'd be ready to cast their lot with the people of God.
Be ready to make it known that I'm a Christian. No matter what it's going to cost me, no matter the, the consequences, but I'm tired of being a secret disciple. And I'm willing to sign my name on this thing for all the world to see that I belong to Jesus. I'm thankful many years ago that I signed that document. I signed that. I didn't sign a card. That's not what I'm saying. I trusted the Lord, and I made it known. And he's been good to me ever since. And he's going to continue to be good to me. And this morning, I'd recommend Jesus to you. If you've never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, he stands ready to save you. If you have trusted him, you just never made it known, I encourage you to cast your lot with the people of God. Listen, you don't have an unsure future with the Lord. Our future is sure. We're not going to lose. We may be put to death, but if we're put to death here, we gain a a greater, there's going to be a, the Bible talks about a better resurrection. In Hebrews chapter 11, there were those that were put to death. They, they could have, uh, they, they, they could have compromised and, and been taken down from the stake, but they were willing to die that death because they were looking for a better resurrection. And if, if our lives are taken as the people of God, then we're going to gain eternity. So what is there to fear in that? This morning, would you be counted and numbered with the people of God. Let's have a verse of invitation song.